Russian researchers in the late 1940s kept people awake for 15 days using an experimental gas-based stimulant. They were kept in a sealed environment to carefully monitor their oxygen intake so that the gas didn't kill them, since in high concentrations it was quite toxic. This was before closed circuit cameras were invented, so they only had microphones and 5 inch thick glass porthole sized windows into the chamber to monitor them. The chamber was stocked with books, places to sit but no bedding, running water and a toilet and enough dried food to last all five for over a month. The test subjects were political prisoners deemed enemies of the state during World War II. Everything was fine for the first five days. The subjects hardly complained, having been promised, falsely, that they would be freed if they submitted to the test and did not sleep for 30 days. Their conversations and activities were monitored and it was noted that they continued to talk about increasingly traumatic incidents in their past, and the general tone of their conversations took on a darker aspect after the four day mark. After five days, they started to complain about the circumstances and events that had led them to where they were and started to demonstrate severe paranoia. They stopped talking to each other and began alternately whispering to the microphones or the one-way mirrored portholes. Oddly, they all seemed to think they could win the trust of the experimenters by turning over their comrades, the other subjects in captivity with them. At first, the researchers suspected this was an effect of the gas itself. After nine days, one of them started screaming. He ran the length of the chamber, repeatedly yelling at the top of his lungs for three hours straight. After this, he continued attempting to scream, but he was only able to produce occasional squeaks. The researchers postulated that he had physically torn his vocal cords. The most surprising thing about this behaviour is how the other captives react to it, or rather, didn't react to it. They continued whispering to the microphones until the second of the captives started to scream. The two non-screaming captives took the books in the place apart, smeared page after page with their own faeces, and pasted them calmly over the glass portholes. The screaming promptly stopped and so did the whispering in the microphones. After three more days passed, the researchers checked the microphones hourly to make sure they were still working, since they thought it impossible that no sound could be coming from the room with these people inside it. The oxygen consumption of the chamber indicated that all of them must still be alive. In fact, it was the correct amount of oxygen that they would have to consume with a very heavy level of strenuous exercise. On the morning of the 14th day, the researchers did something they swore they would not do to get a reaction from the captives. They used the intercom inside the chamber, hoping to provoke any response from the captives that they were now afraid were dead or had become vegetables. They announced, We are opening the chamber to test the microphones. Step away from the door and lie flat on the floor or you will be shot. Compliance will earn one of you your immediate freedom. To their surprise, they heard a single phrase in a calm voice respond. We no longer want to be freed. Debate broke out among the researchers and the military force funding the research. Unable to provoke any more response using the intercom alone, it was decided to open the chamber at midnight on the 15th day. The chamber was flushed of the stimulant gas and filled with fresh air, and immediately voices from the microphone began to object. Three different voices began begging, as if pleading for the life of loved ones to get that gas turned back on. The chamber was opened and soldiers sent in to retrieve the test subjects. They began to scream louder than ever, and when the soldiers saw what was inside, they screamed too. Four of the five subjects were still alive although no one could rightly call the state of any of them living. The food rations past day five had not been so much as touched, 
There were chunks of meat from the dead test subject's thighs and chest stuffed into the drain in the centre of the chamber, blocking the drain and allowing roughly four inches of water to accumulate on the floor. Precisely how much of the water was actually blood was never determined. All four surviving test subjects also had large portions of muscle and skin torn away from their bodies. Their destruction of flesh and exposed bone on their fingertips indicated that the wounds were inflicted by hand, not with teeth as they had originally thought. Closer examination of the position and angles of the wounds indicated that most, if not all of them, were actually self-inflicted. The abdominal organs below the ribcage of all four test subjects had been removed. While the heart, lungs and diaphragm remained in place, the skin and most of the muscles attached to the ribs had been torn off, exposing the lungs through the ribcage. All of the blood vessels and organs remained intact. They had merely been removed and laid out on the floor, fanning out around the eviscerated but still living bodies of the subjects. The digestive tract of all four could be seen to be working, digesting food. It quickly became apparent that what they were digesting was their own flesh, that they had ripped off and eaten over the course of days. Most of the soldiers were Russian special operatives at the facility, but still many refused to return to the chamber to remove the test subjects. Those inside continued to scream to be left in the chamber, and alternately begged and demanded that the gas be turned back on, lest they fall asleep. To everyone's surprise, the test subjects put up a fierce fight in the process of being removed from the chamber. One of the Russian soldiers died from having his throat ripped out, another was gravely injured by having his testicles ripped off, and an artery in his leg severed by one of the subject's teeth. Another five of the soldiers lost their lives if you count the ones that committed suicide in the weeks following this incident. In the struggle, one of the remaining living test subjects had his spleen ruptured and he bled out almost immediately. The medical researchers attempted to sedate him, but this proved impossible. He was injected with more than ten times the normal human dose of a morphine derivative and still fought like a cornered animal, breaking the ribs and arm of one doctor. His heart was seen to beat for a full two minutes after he had bled out, to the point where there was more air in his vascular system than blood. Even after it stopped, he continued to scream and flail for another three minutes, struggling to attack anyone within reach and repeating the word more over and over, weaker and weaker until he finally fell silent. The surviving test subjects were heavily restrained and moved to a medical facility. Those with intact vocal cords continuously begging for the gas, begging to be kept awake. The most injured of them was taken directly to the surgical operating room that the facility had. In the process of preparing the subject to have his organs placed back within his body, it was found that he was effectively immune to the sedative they had given him to prepare him for surgery. He fought furiously against the restraints when the anaesthetic gas was brought out to put him under. He managed to tear most of the way through a four inch wide leather strap on one wrist, even though the weight of a 200 pound soldier was holding that arm as well. It took only a little more anaesthetic than normal to put him under, and the instant his eyelids fluttered and closed, his heart stopped. In the autopsy of the test subject that died on the operating table, it was found that his blood had tripled the normal level of oxygen. His muscles that were still attached to his skeleton were badly torn, and he had broken nine bones in his struggle to not be subdued, most of them from the force of his own muscles. The second survivor had been the first of the group to stop screaming. His vocal cords had been destroyed and he was unable to beg or object to surgery. His only reaction was by shaking his head violently in disapproval when the anaesthetic gas was brought near him. When someone suggested reluctantly that they tried surgery without anaesthetic, he nodded and he did not react for the entire six hour procedure of replacing his abdominal organs and attempting to cover them with what remained of his skin. The surgeon presiding stated repeatedly that it should be a medical impossibility for someone like this to still be alive. 
One terrified nurse assisting the surgery stated that she had seen the patient's mouth curl into a smile several times whenever his eyes met hers. When the surgery ended, the subject looked at the surgeon and began to wheeze loudly, attempting to talk while struggling. Assuming this must be something of drastic importance, the surgeon had a pen and pad fetched so that the patient could write his message. It was a simple two-word sentence. Keep cutting. The other two test subjects were given the same surgery, both without anaesthetic as well, although they had to be injected with a paralytic for the duration of the operation. The surgeon had found it impossible to perform this delicate procedure, while the patients laughed continuously. Once paralysed, the subjects could only follow the attending researchers with their eyes. The paralytic cleared their system in an abnormally short amount of time, and they were soon trying to escape their bonds. The moment they could speak, they were again asking for the stimulant gas. The researchers tried asking why they had injured themselves, why they had ripped out their own guts, and why they wanted the gas again. But there was only one response given. I must remain awake. All three subjects' restraints were reinforced, and they were placed back in the chamber awaiting determination as to what exactly would be done with them. The researchers, facing the wrath of their military benefactors for having failed the stated goals of their project, considered euthanizing the surviving subjects. The commanding officer, an ex-KGB instructed, saw potential and wanted to see what would happen if they were put back on the gas. The researchers strongly objected, but they were overruled. In preparation for being sealed in the chamber again, the subjects were connected to an EEG monitor and had their restraints padded for the long-term confinement. To everyone's surprise, all three of the subjects stopped struggling the minute it was let slip that they would have the gas again. It was obvious at this point that all three were putting up a great struggle to stay awake. One of the subjects that could speak was humming loudly and continuously. The mute subject was straining his legs against the leather bonds with all of his might, first left, then right, then left again, so that he could focus on something. The remaining subject was holding his head off his pillow and blinking rapidly. Having been the first to be wired for EEG, most of the researchers were monitoring his brainwaves with surprise. They were normal most of the time, but sometimes they flatlined inexplicably. It looked as if he were repeatedly suffering brain death before he then returned to normal. As they focused on the paper scrolling out of the brainwave monitor, only one nurse saw his eyes slip shut at the same moment that his head hit the pillow, and as this happened, his brainwaves immediately changed to that of deep sleep and then flatlined for the final time, and his heart simultaneously stopped. The only remaining subject that could speak started screaming to be sealed in now. His brain waves showed the same flat lines as the one who had just died from falling asleep. The commander gave the order to seal the chamber with both subjects inside, as well as three researchers. One of those researchers immediately drew his gun and shot the commander point blank between the eyes. He then turned the gun on the mute subject and blew his brains out as well. He pointed his gun at the remaining subject, still restrained to a bed as the remaining members of the medical and research team fled the room. I won't be locked in here with these things! Not with you! He screamed as the man on the strapped him to the table. What are you? he demanded. I must know! The subject smiled. Have you forgotten so easily? the subject asked. We are you. We are the madness that lurks within you all, begging to be free at the very moment of your deepest animal mind. We are what you might hide from. We are hide what you hide from in beds every night. We are what you sedate into silence, what you sedate into paralysis when you go to the nocturnal haven where we cannot tread. The researcher paused, then aimed at the subject's heart and fired. The EEG flatlined as the subject weakly choked out. So 